A lot of times I like to, when I'm leading that song in worship, as you notice that I did last night, I like to change the words around and just hear the Father say, I am a good, good Father. That's who I am. And you are loved by me. And that's who you are. And I am perfect in my, all my ways. And I like to add in other words, I am faithful in all my ways. I am good in all my ways. Again, it's just so profoundly powerful when you hear the Lord speak those things to you. The thing that happens is that He becomes present to you. You know, we were singing, I want to get that song actually from you, um, Dan, but the one about Jesus loves me, right? It's truth. It's declarative truth, and it's good truth, but it's a whole other thing if you take the, that chorus. I don't even know it, but something to the effect, you know, but I, Jesus, love you. I really do love you. When you hear him speak first person like that, it brings God into the moment. It brings him into the present. When things are in second person or third person, second person's not bad when we're speaking to God. You know, Lord, you are this and you are that. That's helpful. But when you hear first person, he becomes present, fully in you and through you. You recognize again that the only way that the people ever experienced God's word was through the human voice. People didn't have the scripture to read until just several hundred years ago. They heard it through the human voice. They heard it with pace and tone and inflection and facial expression. Yeah. So just pay attention because there's songs that are really, really powerful to allow the Lord to sing them to you, sing them back to you. As we go into the God sighting practice, too, that opening line, right? Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. Keith, right? Keith, that last thing, that last thing you read from that woman. It's why God sightings are so important. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think he's like too. And she just gave us one. What an awful description. And that she would rather depersonalize God. Because the person she thinks that he's like, she doesn't want anything to do with. I was sharing about sharing the gospel with the guys yesterday morning, and it made me think of the fact that I, I made this comment to them where a friend might say, Mark, I really like you. And, and I would respond to them, well, that's great. That means you really like God. And I go, no, I don't. I go, no, you really do, because that's, that's who you're experiencing. It means you really like God. No, I don't. Well, describe God for me. And then the description of God they give me, I go, well, I hate that God too. I wouldn't want anything to do with that God. But I'm telling you, the God that I know is the God who's in me, who's revealing himself to you. There were times when I was doing evangelism with YWAM out in the streets, and I, I was, the Lord had made this, this transformation in my way of thinking where Instead of leading with my testimony, I'd ask people about, you know, it, just let's pretend that there might even be a God, and if that God's big enough, and he's really a God, that maybe he could actually speak. Maybe he could actually reveal himself. Maybe he'd want to be known. Imagine that. And a lot of times I'd ask him first, describe God in the way you would love. If there had to be a God, what would you want that God to be like? Then they give me this description, and I say, well, you know what's really fascinating? Is that there is a God, according to the Bible, who says he's the living God, he's the only God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and you know what? He actually appeared to a human being called Moses, passed by him, and guess what he said? I am Yahweh. I am the I am who is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger, and abounding in love and faithfulness. 
that I maintain love to thousands and forgive wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Kind of sounds like the God you kind of wish there was. He actually exists. But you know what else he did? There are so many people that there's a thousand stories, there's a thousand conversations of people describing God or deciding if they just want him to be impersonal and the pantheism-like viewpoint and whatever else. And I go, well, the problem is, is he says he is God, that he is a person. But to interrupt our conversations, I felt like one day the Lord said is that Jesus is God's divine interruption in our conversations about him. He is God's divine interruption about our conversations about it. I mean, if, if imagine if Bob LaBelle's sitting here one day and, and we're all talking about Bob, and I go, oh no, man, Bob's about five foot three, he's a little scrawny dude, you know, doesn't really amount to anything, and Bob's sitting right there, and, and wouldn't you want to like step in, Bob, and go, yo, <laughs> that is way off. It's like all these descriptions, people describing God and thinking what he's like, and one day he says, you know what? Enough. He becomes a human being and shows up on the planet and says, let me reveal myself in a way that you'd actually get it. Jesus is God's divine interruption in all those stories. All those ponderings and wonderings and say, look, let me just take the veil away and let me show you who I really am. This is again why that night, oh what a night, when Jesus says, if you've seen me. And you know, Keith, in that moment, that description and gratitude that she gave of you was a description of who God really is. You know, it's in that moment, if you'd had the moment, you'd be able to just look at her and say, thank you so much for that email, but you know those things that you said about me? You were describing the personal God who actually lives and loves you and knows you. And if I care, how much more does he care? It's his heart, his love and care in my heart that actually caused me to see you as a person, not treat you as a lab test or whatever else. If I felt that way, how much more is the God who really exists and loves you more than you could ever know and imagine? If you valued me, it means you value God. You ought to get to know him. It's almost like the old, there was an old cornflakes commercial, you know, like you need to taste cornflakes for the first time again. <laughs> you know, I feel like sometimes there are people who have been in churches. It doesn't have to be Catholic, any flavor of church. You almost want to go, you need to like eat the cornflakes again and find out who God really is. Because so many of us would gladly reject people's idea of God. That's not who he described himself to be. And here's the deal, why these God sighting things matter so much is, as I mentioned to you last night, people need to see God. They need to see who he's like up close and personal. What God's facial expression looks like, what his tone of voice looks like, what his touch looks like, what that compassion feels like coming through the heart of a doctor. And you're going to touch people in Manchester, New Hampshire, that if Jesus were still here physically, he would never get there. And so instead, he says, it's good that I go, because then I can send my spirit, and you can be my presence. My physical, human presence to those people. And honestly, Brian, that's where, wherever you, there you are, right in the front row. But you started too. I mean, you grew up, you mentioned, you grew up in church, right? You had an idea, but then you experienced Brett, right? That... You experienced Jesus. You experienced the true God. And what happened? Oh my gosh, you were attracted to him. You understand all this nonsense? And I, Mark, be careful. <clears throat> Because I know we need to be culturally relevant in some form in church. I get that. But I'm telling you, sound and lights and whatever is not the attraction model of the Christian faith. You and I are supposed to be the attraction. And that's what happened to you. And that's what happened to that lady. 
She encountered the living God who is a person. And the desperate need for us to understand that he wants to transform us so that we are him in the places that we can get to. People would fall in love with Jesus if they just saw him, if they just knew him. They would be attracted and drawn to God. How can you not be? Look what happened to your life. Look what she feels prompted to write an email, but she doesn't know that she's actually writing an email to God, thanking him for what he was like and how he cared for her. And you guys, this is what makes the joy of living every day, is that it's stories. One day in, in, in a, a vineyard meeting, I hadn't been to a vineyard conference in 11 years because five little kids all close together in age, you couldn't get anybody to do that for a week. It was tough enough to get them to do it for a day or a night. Take them to four different schools, put them to bed at night, blah, blah, blah. Nobody would do it. Robin's mom died at 51 of cancer, and she did them when they were little, but we just couldn't go. And so I went to one of our vineyard conferences in the early days of the vineyard meetings when John Wimber would finish teaching. We would pause and we'd just be silent and then he'd just say, Lord, whatever you want to do now. And then God would show up in the room. And the amazing thing was it wasn't about the superstars. He used to say, everybody gets to play. And he would call it clinic. And all around the room, everybody played. You were receiving, you were giving, you were receiving, you were giving, and all kinds of unbelievable things were happening. Power things, deep emotional things. But then what would happen is that the meetings would go on later, you know, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, but nobody would leave because everybody's standing in the aisles, in the lobby, where they were at, and everybody's telling stories. Did you see that? Oh, let me tell you what God did. This was amazing. We'd go to the restaurants, and everybody's, whip, 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 and then the people standing in the line with you waiting to get in are going, what are you guys talking about? And you couldn't help it. Oh, we were just at this thing, man. God just grew my leg. Look, my pants. I used to have them hemmed. And they're the pants, you know. The pants are too high above his shoes because God grew his leg out. I was with them, man. When I saw that leg just go out like this, you're like, oh. <laughs> so I go back to a conference 11 years later, and at the end of the meeting, everybody just walked out. So I went to the leader, and I said, dude, I said, it feels like God's not here. I know theologically he's here, but the way he was here, that was just so obvious. So I asked him, I said, how do you recognize the presence of the Lord in a gathering? There it is. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Toby. <laughs> Stole my thunder. There it is. But you know, without hesitation, he said, stories. And I go, what? Stories? And that's when he rehearsed what I just did with you. He said, Mark, think about the early years. Nobody, nobody, nobody could move without telling a story. Talking about what he'd done in our lives. It's what makes the joy of being a Christian the most exciting thing in the world, is that you bring the Lord's presence where you are. And he will give you things to say, to notice. And so many times, it's even just the littlest things become prophetic. That's what I want to tell you in the last session this afternoon, that it's just remarkable how you'll just see and you'll come up to somebody, you'll just say something, you'll give them a word, and they'll go, how did you know? And I go, know what? Well, I was just sitting here thinking, Lord, if you, God, if you exist, I just wish somebody would. And you just did that. I go, I don't know. I was just saying, Lord, who do I love today? And you realize how much the most fascinating thing, and I don't want to steal my afternoon thunder, but we so limit prophecy to thinking it's just words. But I'm telling you, actions can become profoundly prophetic and in such a way that you will never forget it the rest of your life. You will never forget it the rest of your life. 
And that's what transformed our Sunday morning gatherings, was that people started expecting God to show up, and you would move around and you'd go to love people, and then they would say, how did you know that? I'll tell you more about that this afternoon. All I'm saying, you guys, is I've heard a thousand stories. Jesus was God's divine interruption and says, enough. Let me tell you and show you who I really am. And he's invited us into that family business. <coughs> Yahweh and sons and daughters. <laughs> Image makers. Transforming people into Christ-like lovers of God and others. That's the business we're in. Because there are tons of people just like that lady who think they don't want anything to do with God because of their perception of him. And the only way that's going to change is us. Do you believe that? Yeah. I'm serious. And especially right now, because the culture has shifted so much, is that they're not interested in our words. They're going to pay attention to our lives first. And then, which is really the way evangelism worked in the first place, right? In Colossians 4, 1 Peter 3, both Peter and Paul say, and be ready to give an answer to those who ask you. You know, my first 18 years, I used to think something's wrong with that text because nobody ever asked me. Well, because my idea of evangelism, I was supposed to go out there and share the gospel. You know what happened? God started changing around saying, Mark, pay attention, love them well, and in the process of that, you know what starts happening? Why'd you do that? Why'd you care? Why'd you notice? They write you some email and you get an opportunity to have a conversation. We're supposed to lead with love. Not with, not with words, necessarily. And a love that they can't understand. A love so undescribable. I can hardly speak. This is why God sightings matter, you guys. So, open up in your notes. And God help me. Hey, Al, it's uh, point number nine in last night's talk. I it. Oh, good. <laughs> I found it, too. All right, so <clears throat> the God sighting practice. Seriously, let me just stop and pray, because I really got to stick with the notes, and I need help to do that. <laughs> Discipline. Discipline, Lord. Father, again, it's something a little bit different, unfamiliar. I pray that you'd help my brothers, your sons. I pray that you'd help them to grasp everybody's tired. But Lord, I felt like those opening 10 minutes matter, especially in light of what we heard. So I just pray that you'd give the guys grace now and give me the discipline to stay focused so that they can go off and spend some time with you and then in group. So help in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is a God sighting? It's experiencing God love us in a physical way by the Spirit as he did the disciples through Jesus. There are many times people, when they first hear me use the phrase God sightings, they will think, well, I saw God in the sunrise and I saw him in creation, and all that's also true. But this is about the fact that it's God sightings, meaning how do we see God again up close and personal, like the disciples did and others, through Jesus, that God became physically present to us so that they can really see him, so that there's a way in which people could, we could finally say, if you've seen me, you've seen him. Mostly it came from these two passages, which again is about Jesus and about us, A and B. John wrote the word, God the Son became flesh and made his dwelling among us. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father has made him known. And there in the parentheses, I remind you, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. No one has ever seen God but. 
Letter B, though, John wrote this later in his letter. He says, no one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in or among us, and His love is brought to full expression among us. The idea, again, is that it's supposed to continue through us. No one ever had seen God until Jesus, but now He says, by the Spirit, no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another... He is dwelling among us, and His love, once again, reaches full measure, full expression in all of its variety. You understand? Well, now I'm going to steal afternoon's thunder. Thank you. Discipline, discipline. Help me, Jesus. So let us see. The beginning of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he has this great moment, and I've personalized it here for you. It says, Listen to the Father's heart through Paul. I, your Father of compassion and God of all comfort, Comfort you in all your troubles, so that you can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort you yourselves have received from me. Do you get the pattern? You know, actually, um, Brian, the Colossians text? Why people always go to 1 Corinthians 13, as they call it the love chapter, that starts off, love is patient, love is kind, and then has eight negatives. You read the actual love passage. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with one another. But there's the pattern when he says, forgive one another just as I, the Lord, forgave you. You don't forgive because it's the Christian thing you do. You give it away because you experienced it first. And then right here he says, I am the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort. Let me comfort you first, and then you'll comfort others with, it, with the comfort you yourselves have received from me. That's the pattern. You give away what you've experienced, right? But the question is, is for all of us, how do you experience comfort? Some of you have had family members, friends die. What did comfort look like? Well, most of the time, I think for most of us, comfort is somebody's coming alongside us, being present, maybe putting an arm around us, maybe not giving us the big hug, but it's about being present. Oftentimes it's touch, especially the power of listening. I forgot, I have, that, I have that chapter of Bonhoeffer, I actually copied it in one of my journals. And it was really good to be reminded of that. It is so true, you guys. Remember I said to you last night, location, 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 understanding, 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 and the key to understanding is you've got to listen. That was really good to be reminded. Anyhow, how do we get comforted? Listen, presence, whatever. But notice letter D. Later in that same letter, in chapter 5, look what Paul wrote. For when we, Paul and Timothy, came into Macedonia, we had no rest. But we were harassed at every turn. Anybody felt like they've been harassed at all? Conflicts on the outside, fears within. Anybody relate? I love Paul being real. Right here he's being real. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by the com His coming, but also by the comfort you had given Him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Do you realize? He, he began the letter by saying, God is the God of all comforts. And you're supposed to give away the comfort that you've received. But then he finally tells us later in the letter, he says, God comforted us. And how did he do it? Through Titus. And through the love that the Corinthians had given Titus, and he passed that on to them. It came through human form. God became physically present through Titus and showed comfort and got him through this difficult time. So many, many times the Father is loving us, expressing comfort, compassion, whatever it might be, through one another. And Paul explicitly states that that is true. But then letter E, Paul also in the Philippians letter, he also believed that the love that he expressed was also the very love of Jesus. Notice what he writes. He says, it's right for me to feel this way. He was describing the joy and the love that he had for them. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. It wasn't just his own love for them, but he recognized that there was this unique unity and blend that if I feel this way, that's also the affection of Christ Jesus for you. 
and don't miss it. So in 4.1, he says to them, he says, you are my joy and my crown, the ones whom I love and I long for. And oh, that they wouldn't miss that, that that's not just Paul saying that, but it's the affection of Christ Jesus who says to you, you are my joy and my crown, the ones whom I love and I long for. So as many times it's our own expression of love that we also can recognize that's the very heart of the Father. That's the heart of Jesus being manifest through us to another. Pay attention to that. So, the God sighting practice has these five parts. We're only going to focus on a couple of them. But it's remember with thanks, personalize, vocalize, meditate, and imitate. Go ahead and just turn the page and we'll jump right into it. In the exercise that you're going to do this morning, you're going to write about an experience, an interaction that you've had. My hope is that it may have even happened while you've been here. But it could have been something that happened this week. If it's one that touches you really, really deeply, you may even have to go back a little bit. The truth is, I even said to some of the, <laughs> to the facilitators, I said... Remember Jesus, before he talks about the lost son, he talks about the lost sheep and the lost coin? You realize that sometimes we feel more emotionally attached to our dog, our lost sheep, sometimes a little bit more to our truck, our golf club, our rifle, that you'd feel more emotion over losing that, or that getting damaged or lost, maybe. And it's nice that Jesus included a lost coin and a lost sheep. (laughs) The the point is, is that when you go into this exercise, you are trying to find those moments where you were touched emotionally by an experience that you had so that you can connect with the heart of God. So anyway, but where this first came was actually from Paul. Notice here. The first thing is that you're going to write out your thanksgiving. You're going to give thanks to God for this experience that you had. So Paul wrote, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all of my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. You notice that Paul pauses and remembers. You know, one of the things that so radically transformed my, my prayer time, you know, I mentioned to you yesterday, that so many times when people pray, it's just a quick prayer and say, God bless this, do that. When I, was, when I was internalizing and meditating on Matthew 6, when he says, look at the birds of the air, they don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet I, your heavenly Father, feed them, and are you not much more valuable than they? And then he says, look at the, the, the grass of the field. Solomon wasn't even dressed like one of these. So he says, don't worry about your life. The pagans run after all those things, and I know that you need them. You know, when you've heard that hundreds and hundreds of times from the Lord at the beginning of your day, it gets really hard to go, oh God, would you please fix this or would you do that? It just feels weird. It's like I go, well, Lord, you know about this, that, and the other thing, and you know that I need it, and you love me more than you love the birds, and so, hot dog. So now what do I pray about? (laughs) But you know what I learned from Paul? is that every one of Paul's prayers is never, bless me, fix me, provide for me, do this, Lord. He prayed for those he loved. Every one of his prayers are these lists of saying, Lord, do this for the ones I love. Oh God, I pray that their love would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. For this reason, I kneel before you, Father, that out of your glorious riches today, you would strengthen them with power by your Spirit in their inner being, where Jesus dwells in their hearts by faith. I pray, Father, that you would root and ground them more deeply in your love. He prayed for people. He remembered people. And you realize people is the only, the only thing we're taking into eternity with us. It's the only investment worth investing in. It changed my prayer time. I just finally acknowledge, Lord, here's my needs. I surrender. I'm weak. I need you. And I know you care. So here you have it. So now let's get on with praying about the ones you love. So we remember with thanks. Letter B, following Paul's example. We review our day to remember our interactions with family, friends, or other people. The interactions could be one, how someone loved us. Two, how we loved someone. Or three, a loving interaction we observed. 
We then write all the details of the experience as a prayer of thanks to God, using ours or their words, tone of voice, actions, emotions, facial expressions, body language. C, remembering, is a way to obey Paul's appeal. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. And as I mentioned that verse to you last night, number two, it's a way of intentionally beholding or contemplating those moments when God's kind of love manifests, becomes visible again to or among us. Do you realize that so many moments go by in a day where we are loved or we are loving and we never We don't have a practice to remember them and capture them, focus on them, meditate on them so that we get loved again. Stand up for a second. Some of you are struggling. The the problem is I see you start nodding, and then I'm already loud anyway, but then I get louder, and you don't want that. So just listen to me standing just for a second. Keep the blood flowing. But here's the idea again. All you're going to do is that... (coughs) You remember with thanks, but you try to remember all the details. What what did you do? What did you say? What you were thinking and feeling when you loved someone or when they loved you? Or, again, it can be an observation of of a loving interaction, which I said um, yesterday with James. It just so touched me when I imagined him saying to his daughters, you know, look in daddy's eyes. Look at my face. Get your head up. And in that moment, I just pretended... I put myself in your daughter's place, and your face became the face of the father. Your tone of voice became the tone of the father's voice saying, get your head up, look into my eyes. So you want to write those details, and I'm, I've got some examples here, so you'll see what it looks like. Okay, are you awake again, sort of, kind of? All right, go ahead, sit down for a sec. Number four, personalize our how much more, and vocalize it. Letter A, we rewrite our thanks with the Spirit's guidance so that the Lord speaks to us and loves us through the content of our loving interaction as statements of how much more. This idea came from Jesus' comparisons. Jesus is the one that gave me this idea. It's not Mark Fee's creation. This practice is just putting into practice what Jesus said and what Paul did. The idea came, he says, you parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, would you give them a stone? If they ask for a snake, or ask for a fish, would you give them a snake? If you, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, Mm -hmm. how much more will I, your Father in heaven, give good gifts to those who ask me? That's where it began with me, was that, I think I was sharing with you guys about hugging my, my girls, right? And I was memorizing that verse and meditating on it, and in that moment, I had the experience with the girls the night before. And all of a sudden I hear the Father say, Mark, if you, though you're imperfect, can feel that kind of love for the girls, how much more? How much more do I feel for you, son? And in that moment I put myself in the, in the memory so that I'm seeing God as me on the couch and I'm the girls and imagining, really, you want to hug me that tight? You want me to get it? You're aching that much for me to know what's in your heart for me? Seriously, God, say it again. I love you, son. It just bugs me that I can't get it into you the way I want to get it into you. Wow, Father, that's amazing. And then letter C, we trust the Holy Spirit's guidance. Dallas Willard writes, God's gracious incursions into our souls can make our thoughts his thoughts. He will help us learn to distinguish when a thought is ours alone and when it is also his. And what I mean by that is as you write this part out, you're writing it from the Lord. You write the thanks, you're going to take the content of that thanks and allow the Lord to use it to speak about that to you, first person. But as you're doing it, don't be afraid to keep writing the other thoughts that pop into your mind. So now let me give you an example. And then at the bottom it says, um, vocalize, which if you remember, yeah, like you said, Bob, who remembers anything I said I'm not kidding. It was one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to get out of pastoring. You spend 15, 20 hours a week preparing a sermon, and then you give it, and then you ask somebody an hour later, and they don't remember what you said. Or even the crazier thing is I thought I had these great points, and you know what you watch happen in like a room like this? 
and I'm aware of this. I'm saying things, but your brain and the Holy Spirit are having all kinds of personal interactions. So I'd get done and I'd say, what was really blessed you today? Well, Pastor, when you said da-da-da-da-da, and i go, never said it. <laughs> Excellent! I spent all that time and why you and the Holy Spirit are not paying attention. But I'm serious, man. It just, it got discouraging. You preach sermon after sermon, people come in for counseling, and I go, you know, I've probably done five series on that over the last five years. Then you realize it's because almost none of us can internalize something that we heard one time. You have to think about it, meditate on it, practice it, regurgitate it, talk about it to somebody else. Whatever you got to do, the way you get things internalized, you have to spend time with it. And after a while, I just said, Lord, if, if the number one goal is about transformation, then, then preaching is probably the least effective tool in my tool belt. I'm dead serious. You realize Sunday morning has a place, but the Sunday morning service is the least effective transformation tool in our tool belt. It's doing this. It's intensives. It's in that small group time. It's hanging out together, processing things together. It's discipleship. That's what changes us. Amen. Amen. Seriously. Thank you, Brian. I'm not kidding. That's the biggest reason I got out of being a senior pastor. I said, God, if I'm going to spend 15, 20 hours a week, I'd rather spend it with the guys. Processing a text together. I'd rather spend it with the leaders. Loving on them. I'm telling you, just for me, it personally got really, really discouraging. Doing that week in and week in, what's the thing, you know, do the same thing over and over, expect different results? <laughs> I'm serious. I just said, Father, get me out of here. I don't want this role. I, I want to do, do the stuff that makes a difference. That's why I'm running around the, the world and this, everywhere trying to share these things, because these things changed my life. And I know it can do the same for you, I think, too. So the next page. Here's what it's going to look like. You're, there's a, there's a, a, a sheet and a couple pages, but here's what it looks like. You'll see the headings. You'll see there's a heading, When Someone Loved Me. In the middle, you see When I Loved Someone, or I should say it as it is, When Someone Loved Him, When He Loved Someone, and When He Observed a Loving Interaction. You're going to have this worksheet that's going to have those three categories, but here's the deal. They're just there as reminders. If you do one, two, or three god sighting things of the same kind, terrific. If you're only able to come up with one, terrific. And I don't care which kind it is. The main thing is, is that we're trying to find that moment again where you've seen God <laughs> loving through you or loving through someone else to you or you've observed it between another. And that you would sit down and you would record this thing. So... What it looks like then is so the first one, when someone loved me, and I put a note here, generally we thank God in two ways. Giving thanks for how the person expressed their love, but two, giving thanks to God for loving us through them that way. In this way we acknowledge that the person loved us and that our triune God manifested his love to us through that person as well. Again, it's awkward, it's new, it's whatever. Do your best, but I hope these examples now will help drive it home. So here's what I wrote. <clears throat> I had a friend, <clears throat> and this was just, I hadn't seen him in a while, and he picked me up at the airport. And it was just the way that he just came to me and nearly knocked me over. Just a simple thing. So I wrote, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for Sam's enthusiastic hug and words of affection. Bro, so awesome to see you. I've missed you. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to be together. Lord, his excitement, his warmth, and delight in me were so heartwarming. I felt deeply loved. Thank you so much for loving me through him. Okay, so you see some of the details. I've written it out, written it out and it's a prayer to God. Thanksgiving prayer, right? But part two, and you'll do it so that you hear the Lord as you begin this second part with your name. If you'll just put your name first, you'll rewrite it in a way so that God's talking to you. But now here's, look how I wrote it. Mark, if Sam embraced you with such a long, strong hug, how much more do I love and embrace you every time I see you and when we get together? If he missed 
you and loved being with you, how much more do I, Jesus, love connecting with you even now? I am so delighted to spend time with you, to listen to you, to enjoy you and process with you what is happening in your life. Share with me. I'm listening and eager to respond. His smile, his delight, that's mine for you, and so much more. The next one, remembering with thanks. This was my daughter's. Father, thank you for the deep, deep love I felt in my heart for my daughters today. I found so much pleasure in hugging them, lavishing affection on them with kisses, tickling them, and speaking words of endearment. Oh, you guys are awesome. You're so special to me. I love you so much. Lord, I so badly wanted them to grasp how intense and great my love was for them that I squeezed them too tight, which they let me know. Lord, I just love them so much, I was frustrated by the limitation of words and actions to convey the depth of love in my heart for them. Part two, Mark, if you, beloved son, love this deeply, how much more do I love you as my own child? If you can find such pleasure hugging them, kissing them, and tickling them, how much more is my pleasure in you and my joy in lavishing my affection on you? You are awesome to me, special to me, and I couldn't be more proud to love you as my own. How effortlessly it is to speak my words of affection over you. I'm your number one fan. Can you even imagine how, can you ever begin to imagine how deeply I want you to know what's in my heart for you? If you, son, how much more, how much more, and how much more do I long for your girls to know my love as well? Is it making sense? A little bit to you, I hope. There's an, one more example there. <clears throat> Here's the last part. Turn the page. Number six, meditate. <clears throat> so you're going to go off by yourself. You're going to ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, remind me, who have I interacted with? Again, maybe it was one of your brothers over the course of the time here, maybe it was your wife or something before you left or with your kids or a friend. Bring those memories. And sometimes what's really fun is some go both directions. You know how you felt for the guy when you saw him and loved on him and then you experienced him love you, so it turns into a double God sighting. And again, the purpose for this is that you get loved by the Father again. And as you remember it, here's the coolest part, is about the neuroscience part of my dissertation. In one of these books, though, written by a Christian guy, he wrote, we quite literally represent or make present again our experience of the world when we have a memory. More technically, we reactivate the same network of neurons that were initially activated in our original experience. To some extent, experiencing the event all over again. We re-experience or re-presentation, the re-experience or re-presentation is like the original experience, concrete, vivid, and with all our senses. What matters to the neurons in our brains is not whether an event is external, happening presently outside of us, or internal in our brains, but only whether or not the event is experienced as real, concrete, and vivid. We take a truth or a truth-communicating event and mentally experience it as real. Every one of you have heard of post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder is because somebody has a traumatic experience and their brain will remember that experience and if it remembers it like the very first time, it will be that very first time, only another time, and another time. They relive it. They generally relive it because the brain doesn't care. It's just neurons. And if the neurons, the original neurons, get firing and activated again, and you re-experience that thing again, your brain will believe it's having an experience. It will shape you and change you. It was like, finally, I caught that for those 20 years before I first read this, that I've been doing the God sighting practice, I realized that as I was paying attention to those moments when I was loving him and he was loving me, and I was recording it, and then I'd hear him talk to me through it, the final part was as I would relive the memory and I would see it, think about it, hear him talking to me in it, I realized I was getting loved again through the same event. 
And the more times I remembered it, I got loved again. And I got loved again. And oh, guess what? You're getting trained and you got loved again. But you get trained. This is what Jesus did. 11,000 hours. We just have to do it in our minds a lot of times. But He's fully present in those memories. And as I've replayed him and replayed him and replayed him and replayed him and been loved and loved and loved and loved, is what happens is that now it's become second nature to me. And so I see things, I hear things, I watch things, and I just do things now. I can't help myself. That's a good thing. That this unique, profound thing that our brains can do, we don't use it to our advantage. We don't have a practice in our Christian faith to use it to our advantage. Well, my hope is what's going to happen then, you're going to be in your alone time, you're going to write your thanks, and you'll see the, in fact, turn the page, let's just go right there. There's also a couple more examples of God sightings. If you need to read a few more to just help it make sense. Do you see the page that says God sighting exercise? My page says 11. Is yours 11? On page 11... So here's the worksheet, and it's a couple pages because there's space. So you see how the first one says, how did someone love you? If you turn the page, number two, it says, how did you love someone? And you look across on the next page, and you'll see what loving interaction did you observe. And this is where I'm saying to you is that it's just a reminder that there's three kinds. But if you have three of the, the same or you can only write one, don't stress Just ask the Holy Spirit, Lord. And again, in some cases, you may just want to go back to one of the most profound loving experiences you had. If you will replay it and do this, that experience will become just as real and alive again. In fact, remember Keith, right? When Keith was standing here, and Keith, you were telling that story about the gay guy. Did you see the emotion that welled up back in his face? And he doesn't strike me as being a very emotional guy, per se. Keith, you remember the moment, right? Was I, did I see that accurately? You were reliving that experience, and your, your wise got watery, and now you, you, you brought it under control. But if you'd paused there long enough, you, you would have probably got some tears in your eyes. And that memory was a while ago, too, wasn't it? That experience. 20 years ago. But you were telling it, and all that emotion came back. So that's what I'm telling you guys. Even if if you need to go to one of those, do it. Because the Holy Spirit will come into that moment. And that's the connection you want to make. Again, even Brian is saying to him, and and somebody, actually Paul, you felt led to say that to, to Brian. The way you felt for your son. How much more was the father feeling that way in all those years that you were wandering and drifting and He's searching, and in the moment, what he felt when you finally saw him, engaged him. That's the emotion he felt, and so much more for you. So whatever it is, that's what you're looking for. And when what happens in group is when you get into group, each of you will have your turn where you can pick one of those. And you'll be able to say, here's what kind of happened. You'll give a little intro, but then you'll read it. You'll read the thanks to the Lord, But then you're going to speak aloud the how much more so that you hear the Lord speak to you through that experience, through your own voice. But then the facilitator is going to take it and you're going to ask the Holy Spirit to help you engage in the memory and then they're going to speak those words to you so you can just relive the memory and hearing Jesus talking to you in it. And my hope is, is that you will have a profound, loving experience again in that moment. Does that make sense, I hope?